better with his wife? The first lady, Mrs. Rebecca Akufo Ado. We also receive with great pleasure His Excellency, the Vice President. Dr. Alaji Mahamudu Baumi. And his wife, Mrs. Samira Baumia, secondly. May I respectfully acknowledge the presence of my Lord, the Chief Justice, Mrs. Sophia Akufu, and other justices of the Superior Court of Ghana. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, honorable members, His Excellency the President is in the House this morning in accordance with Article 67 of the Constitution of the Republic of Ghana to deliver his message on the state of our dear nation. On behalf of the leadership, honorable members, and other officers of this honorable house, it is my singular honor to welcome His Excellency, the President, to this house. And now, I respectfully invite Mr. President, Nana Adodankwa Ekufu Ado, to deliver his message on the state of our nation. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to be here again in this august house, a place where I have experienced some of the most memorable moments of my political career and made some cherished friendships across the political divide. I'm glad too that in accordance with protocol and precedent, First Lady Rebecca Kufuado, Vice President Mohamedou Baumia, Second Lady Samira Baumia, Chief Justice Sophia Akufu, and the Justices of the Supreme Court, Chairperson Anu Tusribo II, and members of the Council of State, Chief of Defense Staff, Lieutenant General O.B. Aqua, Inspector General of Police, David Asante Pietro, and the service chiefs are all present. Mr. Speaker, the House is duly honored by the welcome attendance of the former Presidents of the Republic, Their Excellencies Jerry John Rawlins, John Ajikum Kufo, and John Dramani Maham. His Excellency, the former Vice President, Parquisi and Mr. Arthur, and former First Lady, Her Excellency Nana Konedu Ajiman Rollins. <laughs> Speaker, that is the way of the world. The founder of the party today is no longer recognized by members of the other party. <laughs> but that's. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I came a year ago, 
I came as our newly elected president into a house where everybody was trying to get used to new positions. There was a large number of fresh entrants trying to find their feet as the new honorable members. There were the hitherto minority members trying to get used to being members of the majority. And then there were the former members of the majority trying to get used to their new role as members of the minority. The House had a new speaker who was beginning to fit seamlessly into his new role. A year later, we can safely say that none of us turns around in surprise when addressed by our new titles. We're all used to the reality made possible by the expression of the free will of the Ghanaian people on December 7th, 2016. The Speaker, at the beginning of each session of Parliament, the President has a duty to come to this House, as I have done today, to satisfy the constitutional requirement of delivering to Parliament a message on the state of the nation, that is to report on how a nation, a nation is faring after this year of change, and to share the prospects we can look forward to in the year ahead. I would like to start by expressing my sincere gratitude to the House. When I told you I was in a hurry, you promptly rose to the challenge. You assisted me to appoint my excellent team of ministers and constitute the government and constitute the government in record time. I understand that since the inception of the Fourth Republic, this, the Seventh, has been the busiest parliament. You've had 140 days of sittings, and I'm, no, I'm told no parliament in its first session has done more than 130 days. This is to the collective credit of members on both sides of the House and your respective leaderships. With the backing of the Right Honourable Speaker and his deputies. In the process, this Parliament has passed a number of bills relating to my flagship programs. Again, I'm told it is a, ta a first in the Fourth Republic, the flagship program and in this case as many as five, have been passed in the first year of the government. I'm grateful and look forward to our continuing to work together to make our nation Ghana great and strong. Mr. Speaker, I believe that last year when I came to the House, I conveyed my dismay at the full extent of the economic mess in which our nation was mired. We had inherited an economy that was in distress. Choked by debt. And with macro and uh, with macroeconomic fundamentals in disarray. disarray. You will call, Mr. Speaker, that I said, quote, we would have to implement some tough prudent and innovative policies to get us out of the financial cul-de-sac we were in. I made some brave predictions. I said we would reduce significantly the budget deficit, and I said that at the same time, we would grow and expand the economy. I'm glad to be able to report, Mr. Speaker, that the economic management team under the stellar leadership of the strong, brilliant economist, <laughs> Vice, Pre <laughs> Vice President Mohamed Mbouaoumia <laughs> has risen to the challenge 
and the hard work is beginning to show positive results. We have reduced taxes. We are bringing down inflation and interest rates. Economic growth is increasing from the alarming 3.6% at December 2016 to 7.9% in our first year. And the indications are that it will be even better this year. We have increased our international reserves, maintained relative exchange rate stability, reduced the debt to GDP ratio and the rate of debt accumulation. We have paid almost half of arrears inherited. And crucially, we are current on obligations to statutory funds. I am also pleased to report that the three-year IMF-supported Extended Credit Facility Program began in 2015 comes to an end this year. The relatively good macroeconomic performance in 2017 will strongly support our successful completion of the IMF program. We are determined to put in place measures to ensure irreversibility and sustain macroeconomic stability so that we will have no reason to seek again the assistance of that powerful global body. Mr. Speaker, we restore teacher and nursing training allowances. We have doubled the capitation grant. And to confound the skeptics and professional naysayers, we have implemented free senior high school education. It has enabled 90,000 more students gain access to senior high school education in 2017 than in 2016. Mr. Speaker, we have non nevertheless been able to meet my promise made last year to the House and reduce the fiscal deficit from 9.3% to an estimated 5.6% of GDP. As I promised, our economists have found imaginative ways to deal with the oppressive debt situation. This has brought some relief, and the annual average rate of debt accumulation, which in recent years has been as high as 36 percent, has declined to 13.6 percent as of September 2017. As a result, as a result, the public debt stock as a ratio of GDP is 68.3%. Against the annual target of 71% for 2017 and end 2016 actual figure of 73.1%. As a result of appropriate policy, and the normalization of the power situation in the country, they have also engineered a spectacular revival of Ghanaian industry from a growth rate of minus negative 0.5% to, in 2016, to 17.7% in 2017. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I do not suggest in any way that these headline grappling figures mean we're anywhere near resolving our economic problems. I am saying, to borrow the language of the economists, that for the first time in a long while, our macroeconomic fundamentals are solid and all the critical indices are pointing in the right direction. 
And the world is taking notice of Ghana's economic strides. Earlier in January, the World Bank stated that Ghana's economy will probably grow by 8.3% this year, which could make it the fastest growing economy in the world. And then last week, last week, Bloomberg described Ghana's stock exchange as the best performing stock exchange in the world for January 2018. The report illustrated how the Ghana Stock Exchange Composite Index has gained 19% since the start of the year in dollar terms, ahead of the Nigerian, Chinese, and Brazilian stock market. Can Oforiata, the finance minister, <laughs> this figure is important that Hansard records me. Can Oforiata, the order, finance minister, order. is proving to be a national asset. I know that when it comes to the economy, many of us have very low tolerance for what we consider as boring figures. And we do not see that they affect the reality of our everyday lives. But as I said earlier in the year, this current set of boring figures happens to spell good news for our economy. There are figures that the most innumerate among us can relate to and which can hardly be described as boring. I refer to the figures that emerge when you look at the difference between sole sourcing of government procurement and opening it to tender. In 2016, the Public Procurement Authority had 622 sole source requests. 597 of that number, i.e. 98%, were approved, and there were 25 rejections. There were 592 requests made for restricted tenders, and 587, 99.15%, were approved, and there were five rejections. A grand total of zero savings was made. In 2017, my first year in office, 394 sole sourcing requests were made, out of which of 223, 56.6% were approved. And 100 and 171, 43.4% rejected. There were 346 requests for restricted tenders, out of which 167, 48% were approved. And 179, 15.2%, 52% rejected. Now here is the interesting part. The savings made over the year as a result amounted to some 800 million CDs. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Speaker, the savings are spectacular and the figures are impressive. And as, I, as my old mathematics teacher and I expect, I suspect everybody else's mathematics teacher would say, you cannot argue with figures. <laughs> we have taken the lessons to heart and continue to improve upon the government procurement process. I said I would protect the public purse. And that is exactly what I am doing. Mr. Speaker, I believe 
it bears repeating here the thanks to these boring figures. For the first time in a long while, we've been able to provide better budgetary support for the constitutionally mandated institutions that hold government accountable, i.e. Auditor General, Parliament, Judiciary, Ministry of Justice, Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, the Economic and Organized Crime Office and the Police. Again, nowhere near the levels we would all like. But when you are starting from inside a deep hole, it takes a while to make an impression on the ground. And the good thing is that we are pointing in the right direction. Mr. Speaker, thanks to the diligence of the hardworking Minister for Employment and Labour Relations, the Honourable Ignatius Bafoy, we are MP for Sunyani West, we have been able to transfer some 3.1 billion CDs of Tier 2 pension funds into the custodial accounts of the pension schemes of the Labour Union. Funds, funds that have been outstanding for six years and about which the labor unions have been loudly complaining. As a result of engagements we, with organized labor, we ensure that the national daily minimum wage was determined and approved before the laying of the 28th budget by the Minister for Finance. And happily, Mr. Speaker, there were no strike actions last year. We will continue the constructive dialogue with organized labor to find mutually satisfactory solutions to their concerns in order to guarantee industrial peace. The Speaker, we are therefore able to say with confidence that we are creating the atmosphere needed for the creation of jobs, easily the most urgent problem that faces the government and the nation. We have put in place the structures to help small and medium-scale enterprises and budding entrepreneurs through the challenging start-up years. The availability of cheaper credit is good news for business in general and means better prospects for jobs. Mr. Speaker, the subject of job creation has to be at the top of my agenda. The number of young people who cannot find work is staggering and a threat to our national security. I'm determined to work to guarantee and secure the future of the young men and women of our country. Every major policy that my government has implemented in the past year has been essentially about the youth. We will equip the youth with the skills that will enable them to be productive. As a start, this government has established the Nation Builders Corps to employ 100,000 young persons in 2018 alone to assist in public sector delivery in health, education, agriculture, sanitation, and the Revenue Collection Department of the Ghana Revenue Authority. Stakeholders have had a series of meetings on this policy, and the modules have been designed for each of the designated areas. The details are currently being fine-tuned, and next month, this policy will formally take off to join the other youth employment initiatives. Just this morning, the respected senior minister, Yao Osafo Mafu, launched the Digital Marketing and Entrepreneurship Program at the Accra Digital Center. This program, with 10 regional training centers, has already recruited 3,000 young unemployed people to undergo a three-month all-expenses-paid training. This we got whatever be the case, Hansad will record me, whatever be the case.
I'm happy to announce oh, no. that Ecobank Ghana Limited has already offered to engage all 3,000 young people after the training program. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Mr. Speaker, for years we have all talked about the need to open up our country. We have all acknowledged that we cannot hope to develop and transform our nation until we do so. And economic and administrative activities are spread around and not restricted to the capital in Accra. We have taken the clear and unambiguous mandate given to this government by the people of Ghana as a spur to take some of these long-promised actions, indeed, to open up our country and transform our economy. This year, we are determined to take the decisions that will change the destiny of our country. On the first working day of this year, I signed into law the act setting up the development authorities. My speaker, Mr. Speaker, the creation of these authorities marks a fundamental change in how part of the development budget, i.e. the equivalent of $1 million per constituency per year, is going to be spent in our country. Local people, local people will make the decision on what their greatest needs are and direct the funds to those areas. Luckily, there's some consensus of what constitutes the basic infrastructure needs in all communities. And we expect a smooth takeoff in the work of these authorities. We're asking that everybody is guided by the priorities set up in the NPP manifesto on which we fought and won the mandate of the Ghanaian people. We expect, for example, the pr provision of water and toilets to feature prominently on the agenda of the development authorities until those two items can be taken of the must-do list of all constituencies around the country. Sixty years after independence, the least we can and should do is to make sure that every Ghanaian has access to water and toilet facilities. Mr. Speaker, the state of sanitation in our cities is wholly unacceptable. Our cities have been engulfed by filth. There's the urgent need for public authorities to find means of making our cities clean. And in the case of Accra, fulfilling my pledge, one of the most ambitious of my presidency, to make it the cleanest city in Africa by the end of my term. Government is working with various private sector authorities to tackle this major challenge with strategies that are intended to effect a change in our attitudes towards waste generation, as well as to improve dramatically our methods of waste management. This will be complemented by the strict enforcement of sanitation rules and regulations. Urgent attention will begin to clearing of rubbish all around the country. Apart from the systematic efforts being made to resolve the legacy of inherited debts in the sector, government will spend this year an amount, exceptionally, of 200 million CDs to address the vexed issue of sanitation. I'm confident that by the time I come back next year, God willing, an appreciable improvement would have been made in the sanitation situation in the country. Mr. Speaker, there have been a number of ambitious decentralization exercises in this country. We are currently engaged in the very big exercise of creating new regions. It is a long and rather complicated process. We are in uncharted territory, but all the indications are that it is going well. And I've been impressed to see political opponents come together to argue, for example, the case for the creation of an OT or North Water region. It is not often you see the veteran statesman, Dr. Obeda Samwa, the vocal Mr. Kofi Adams, 
and the Volta Regional Minister, Dr. Archibald Lecter, on the same side in a public argument. This portends well, and I believe this exercise will be a success, especially as it is being undertaken with scrupulous adherence to the teachings of the Constitution in this sensitive area. Under the skillful direction of the experienced Minister for Regional Reorganization and Development, Honorable Don But Dan Butchie, MP for Okre. Mr. Speaker, yet another ambitious decentralization exercise is the expansion of full democracy to local government. A critical step to this end is the direct election of Metropolitan, Municipal, and Chief District Chief Executives on a partisan basis. It is a firm manifesto commitment of the new Patriotic Party. Further, my discussions with the nation's leaders, including the former Presidents of the Republic, convinced me that it is a step that we must take. The constitutional impediment to this in Article 55 of the Constitution, an entrenched clause must therefore be removed. To ensure the judicious use of the country's resources, I propose that the constitutional processes for a referendum should be initiated in such a manner that the holding of the referendum would take place at the same time as next year's District Assembly elections. If successful, the outcome of the referendum will mean that the current set of MMDCEs will be the last batch of chief executives to be appointed under the current system. I have no doubt that the resourceful Minister for Local Government and Rural Development, Hajia Alima Mahama, MP for Nalerigu Gambaga, will be able to shepherd this process to a positive conclusion. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I'm convinced that the creation of new regions alone would not open up our country. That would not on its own convince our young people that they do not have to come to Accra to make a living. We have to improve upon this transportation system so that no part of this country feels cut off or can be deemed too far from the center. That is one of the most effective ways to stop, to stop the unsustainable rush to Accra. Traffic jams and overcrowding are making our capital unattractive. There are certain inconveniences that people adjust to. Traffic jams are not one of them. We're spending too much time stuck in traffic. It is unproductive. It is not healthy and it is expensive. I fear that one of these days, one more car will join the madness on the roads in Accra and our city will be completely gridlocked. Mr. Speaker, we have to build the roads to open up and link up the various parts of the country. Journey times between parts of the country have to be reduced. It is a shame that almost the seven years or so after work had started on the Eastern Corridor roads, seven years or so after work had started on the Eastern Corridor roads, we are nowhere near completion. We are nowhere near completion. Order, Mr. Speaker, order. I know order. I know from my experience here last year that many members of the minority are allergic to facts, but facts facts will be stated for the benefit of Hansa, whatever be the case. And yet this is a strategic road that will provi provide a much shorter and cheaper link between the northern and southern parts of our country and a suitable alternative road for our landlocked neighbors. Unfortunately, 
This network of roads has suffered from deliberate, unproductive propaganda. It is hard to believe that at the time when cocoa prices were going down, contracts were awarded for three sections of the road to be funded by Cocoa Board. It comes as no surprise. It comes as no surprise that Cocoa Board has issued directives to suspend work on all three sections which come up to almost 100 kilometers. Mr. Speaker, we are determined to find the needed resources to complete the Eastern Corridor roads. <coughs> As I have heard it said amongst the evidence, that which is important, you cook in an important Pot. Mr. Speaker, Nuvevela, what done it? Ne ezevevene. Honourable members, order. Mr. Speaker, even the members of the of the House from the Volta region may want me to repeat that for the record. Nuvevela, what done it? Le ezevevene. Mr. Speaker, there's a crying need for work to be done on all our roads. The Western Corridor, the Central Corridor, Trunk Roads, Feeder Roads, Town Roads around the country all require urgent attention. We're determined to bring our road network to a befitting status. And this year, we shall witness much more activity on the roads. In our current economic circumstances, we are turning our attention to private sector participation to raise the funds to do what needs to be done. I must make mention of the work being done to restore the Accra Tema Motorway to its iconic status. With help from Japan, a loyal friend of Ghana, work is starting to build a three-tier interchange of the motorway roundabout and the plans for expansion into a six-lane motorway will be implemented this year. Mr. Speaker, if we are to open up our country, we have to build a safe, fast, and reliable railway network. Last year, last year I made a brave assessment in this House by stating that the Takradi Topaga Railway would be initiated in the year 2017. I'm happy to report that we are making progress. We are, we are in the final stages of agreeing with a significant investor the terms of a BOT agreement from Takrari to Kumasi, which will be presented to Parliament this session. There's already a contractor on site for the construction of the Kojo Krim to Manso section of the Takradi to Kumasi Railway. The process has commenced also to select a suitable partner for the construction of the Eastern Line from Accra to Tema to Kumasi. We aim to break ground this year. The central spine from Kumasi to Paga is, is also receiving attention and consultants have been engaged to advise government on the best model for the development of the line. Mr. Speaker, 
but those which will be fulfilled, unlike some promises we know from the past. These ones are in the process of being fulfilled. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, with reference to the Ghana and Burkina Faso rail interconnectivity, the two countries are in earnest discussions as to the realization of the project. There are fortnightly meetings, either in Accra or Ouagadougou, and we are confident the deliberations will conclude and actual construction will commence by the third quarter of the year. Mr. Speaker, I know I'm not saying anything new exactly. Every government... Every government has said it. And it has been in every plan we have drawn up in this country since independence. But this, the difference this time, Mr. Speaker, is that we have started. And the dream of a modern railway network in our country will become a reality during the tenure of this administration. Mr. Speaker, a modern, reliable network of roads, railways, water transport, and airports will transform our country. And I'm delighted to note that fresh enthusiasm has entered the aviation sector under the guidance of the Dynamic Minister for Aviation, Cecilia Abdadapa, to look up all parts of the country by air. Mr. Speaker, the advance of technology means we can reach people and get a lot done without much physical movement. The cyber population that is busy on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, WhatsApp, and other social media outlets will testify that Ghana is very much part of the virtual world and its activities. More and more of us are banking and paying our bills online. A wealth of knowledge and information is now available on the net to make teaching and learning easier. We're working to make the child that sits in a classroom have the same opportunity in Zebula, have the same opportunities as the child in a classroom in Ridge Accra. In their own way, these modern communication tools are opening up our country and the world to all of us. The start of the digital address system, the introduction of paperless transactions at our ports, the rapid and continuing spread of broadband services are all helping to formalize and modernize our economy thanks to the creative leadership of the intrepid Minister for Communications, the Honorable Asala Owusu Ekufu, MP for Abdekuma West. Furthermore, subsequent to Cabinet approval, the framework agreement between Ghana and the Republic of Mauritius for an initial investment in the development of a technology park in Dawa in the Greater Accra region Order. has been ratified by Parliament for implementation to begin. Unfortunately and predictably, a whole new set of dangers of cyber insecurity and fraud have emerged with these modern tools. We are working to strengthen cyber security, to build confidence and protect the use of electronic communications in national development and ensure that our young, technologically savvy people would keep Ghana firmly in the exciting IT economy and its many opportunities. Mr. Speaker, we need an educated and skilled workforce to be able to operate the modern economy we are creating. The free SHS is a start towards this goal. Excuse me. It is a policy that has come to stay. We are reforming the school's curricula to deal with the weaknesses in our education system and lay greater emphasis on science, technology, 
engineering, mathematics, reading, history, and technical and vocational schools. And look at the national budget. will tell you that we are spending a lot of money in education. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm certain that it is a worthwhile investment, brilliantly supervised by that charismatic Minister for Education. Honorable Dr. Matthew Prickley Prempe, Member of Parliament for Mencia South. <coughs> you also important that the reform of our school's curricula should instill in our youth respect for the traditional values of discipline, fellow feeling, hard work, honesty, integrity, and patriotism, without which no healthy social development can occur. In much the same way, we do not compromise on the health of the population. We have cleared a substantial part of the debts and the rears that were choking the national health insurance scheme. See, courtesy of the prudent management of the able chartered accountant, Health Minister Honorable Kwaku Ajima Menu, MP for the Namar Central. This has led to the revival of the NHS and the renewal of respect for the NHS card. Please <coughs> order. The health, the health needs of our people are being better served. Moreover, as we work to open up the country, I hope that our efforts at improving the conditions of wealth of work for health workers would be appreciated and would, there would no longer be the reluctance to serve in some parts of Ghana. Mr. Speaker, in line with our commitment to building a fair and inclusive society, we promised last year to increase the share of the District Assembly's Common Fund to persons with disabilities from 2% to 3%, and we delivered. Effective July last year, the policy of ensuring that 50% of the persons who manage the country's toll booths are persons with disabilities started. Nonetheless, we are determined to address the other concerns of persons living with disabilities. A healthy nation, Mr. Speaker, is a well-fed nation. For generations, we have bemoaned Ghana's reliance solely on rain-fed agriculture. This means the slightest change in the rainfall pattern exposed our farmers to the loss of a season's harvest. It is a disgrace that we have had to rely on our Sahelian neighbors to make up the deficit in foods, such as fruits and vegetables. This year, the One Village, One Dam project starts full operation. It is a simple no tech project, but these dams will make a big difference to all our lives and the livelihoods of our farmers. Already, many of the little dams that have been abandoned have been rehabilitated and brought back into use. A deliberate and specific intervention to help farmers is paying off. Our farmers can see that the government is putting resources to back up the usual words. The 50% subsidies on fertilizer and the increase in the provision of extension services are making a great difference to the performance of Ghanaian agriculture. Under the Planting for Food and Jobs scheme, we're witnessing a fresh interest in farming. The success of the first year has encouraged us to increase the scope of the program, and this year, some half a million farmers will be signed on, up from the figure of 200,000 last year. That champion of Ghanaian farmers, the Minister for Food and Agriculture, 
Dr. Owusu Efriye Akuto is doing a yeoman's order, job. Order. Order. Mr. Speaker, fishing in our, in, in our country, an industry that provides a living for 10% of the population, has been bedeviled by many problems in the past. The fishing harvest has gone down dramatically and we have had to depend more and more on imported fish. We have started work to tackle these problems. This past year, we made sure that the close season was respected, not just by the industrial tuna vessels, but also by the trawlers. We will adhere to, to this policy for the fu foreseeable future, which will help us replenish our depleted stocks. More effective measures are being taken against illegal, unreported, and unregulated methods of fishing. We have also instituted measures to avert pre-mixed diversions and strict and auditing of landing beaches are now in place. I can state that since November there's been no report of pre-mixed diversion. A marked improvement from the past. Mr. Speaker, I believe that the future lies in the promotion of agri aquaculture and we have set about it with a lot of enthusiasm. We have identified 100 dams in five regions across the country, Upper East, Upper West, Northern, Volta and Western and stock them with fingerlings. This is the start of big things to come due to the efforts of the forceful Minister for Fisheries and Agriculture, Honorable Elizabeth Afule Quay, MP for Cromwell. Mr. Speaker, agriculture forms the backbone of our flagship One District, One Factory program. The majority of the proposals that have been evaluated and accepted for support under the scheme are agro-based. It is food processing, after all, that has been the takeoff point for industrialization in most developed countries. It also fits in with our determination to open up our country and make jobs and facility, facilities available in all parts of the country. M Mr. Speaker, Problems associated with our environment and the Galamsey phenomenon have taken up a lot of the time and energy of this government. The fight against Galamsey is being spearheaded by a high-powered interministerial committee led by the globally acclaimed Ghanaian scientist, Professor Kwabnab Frimpombwati, Minister for Science, Technology, Environment and Innovation supported by the indefatigable Minister for Lands and Resources and Natural Resources, John Peter Amewu. This committee is waging a valiant struggle to bring the Galamse phenomenon under control. His work has received, thankfully, the wide support of the media. Mr. Speaker, we have had to ban small-scale mining for the past nine months. We acknowledge that the, binding of, the banning of small-scale mining cannot be the long-term solution in a country such as ours, which is blessed with so many min minerals. But as the saying goes, desperate situations call for desperate remedies. We cannot look on as our very existence as a country is put in jeopardy and our water bodies, forests, and landmass are destroyed. Even with the ban, it has been a never-ending battle with the Galamseyers. And I'm sure the House will want to join with me in praying, paying tribute to the members of our forces in the Operation Vanguard that are protecting our environment. They are Ghanaian patriots of the First Order. We have started various schemes to find sustainable alternative sources of income for the Galamseyers. Mr. Speaker, nothing will ever equate the attraction of the search 
for gold or dime, and maybe the drama of actually finding some. But this generation of Ghanaians dares not preside over the destruction of our lands. The state of our rivers and forests remains a great cause for worry, and it is our sacred duty to protect them. I hope I can count on the total support of the House to help nurse our degraded lands and rivers back to health. I'm equally grateful to those chiefs who have supported the fight against Galamse. My government will continue to reach out to our traditional rulers so that together we can address pressing issues facing our nation and its peace and stability. Mr. Speaker, there is relief in some areas, and I refer specifically to the spectacular improvement in our power supply problems. A lot of hard work has gone into easing the intolerable debt situation that threatened to paralyze the energy industry. We still have problems with the cost of power, and we're working to put Ghana at a competitive advantage. We intend to fight private sector operators to buy into the state-owned thermal plants and inject the capital needed to bring power tariffs down for both domestic and commercial consumers. The most reliable and ultimately cheapest answer to our power needs lies with renewable energy sources. We shall promote and enthusiastically encourage investment and use of renewable energy. I'm sure that the House shares my relief that Dumso is no longer part of our everyday lexicon. <laughs> Long may it say so, as we applaud the tireless efforts of the Minister for Energy, Black Energy Minister Bwache Ejaku. The Speaker, the safety and security of our people are at the heart of all that we do. Ghanaian citizens, have a right to expect to go about their daily lives in an atmosphere of peace. A Ghanaian has a right to expect that those who break the law must be subject to the sanctions laid down under the law. The police, the prosecution services, and the judiciary owe it to all of us to make us feel and be safe. I do not need to repeat that crime wears no political colors, and I'm certain that message has well gone down well to all. So, Mr. Speaker, the law enforcement agencies will crack down hard on all those who would disturb the peace of our nation. We will give the police the resources they need to do their job. An initial amount of 800 million CDs is being made available to procure and supply within the next six months critical modern policing equipment and gadgets to enhance the capacity of the police to enforce law and order, including 1,000 vehicles, motor bicycles, motorbikes, and ammunition. <coughs> the, equip the equipment is to facilitate visibility, mobility, and improve responsiveness of the police to ensure a safe, secure, and peaceful economic and social environment for Ghanaians to work and thrive. Already, the successful renegotiation of existing contracts has enabled us to purchase forthwith 100 vehicles for the police. <coughs> To long term, order. We'll purchase drones and helicopters to assist the police combat violent crime and environmental crime. The crime laboratories will be modernized and properly equipped to provide the necessary support. 
The police intelligence unit will also be strengthened. The perennial problems associated with police accommodation will be tackled and a compensation package introduced to cover officers in their line of duty. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I'm aware that the entire nation is extremely anxious and perturbed by the activities of the migrant nomadic, nomadic herdsmen in the country. We're rehabilitating the crowds or ranches that were abandoned after the Kufo-led MPP government left office in 2009. They will become operational shortly to provide secure grazing places for cattle. At the same time, efforts are also being intensified to find an ECOWAS-wide solution to an issue which goes beyond the boundaries of our country and is affecting the entire West African region. Mr. Speaker, we shall not allow miscreants of any sort to terrorize our population. And I promise that there will be no hiding place for criminals. I'm certain that the interventions we are introducing will boost morale in the service, and I urge the House and all citizens to support the police to deliver the service we deserve. The formidable Minister for the Interior Honorable Ambrose Derry, MP for Nando, needs our effective cooperation to carry out his all important functions. Mr. Speaker, in much the same way, we're beginning to address the problems of our armed forces. I'm happy to report that work has started on the barracks regeneration program. The acute accommodation problems that face our armed forces must be and are now being tackled by that energetic Minister for Defence, the Honourable Dominic Nitiwo, MP for Dumbela. We know that it is in all our interests that those charged with ensuring our security and who put their lives on the line for our safety are able to concentrate on their jobs without distractions like inadequate and inappropriate housing. It is vital that all of us give maximum support to the noble, brave men and women of our security services involved in Operation Calm Life, Operation Vanguard, and Operation Cowleg, aid at guaranteeing the safety of our people, the integrity of our environment, and the peace of our nation. The housing deficit is not limited to our security services. It is a nationwide problem that is caused mostly by the intolerable pressure on land prices. This has put affordable housing out of the reach of most people. We have begun the difficult process of making housing affordable for Ghanaians. Ghana government last year abolished the 5% VAT NHIL on real estate sales and continues to create a conducive environment that is reducing interest rates on mortgage loans. Discussions are also ongoing between the Pensions Regulatory Authority and the banks to underwrite an effective mortgage system. This will facilitate access to housing for the ordinary budget. Government will also to continue to create the enabling environment that will promote private sector investment in cheaper housing for the people. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure no one needs reminding in this House that I've signed into law the Office of Special Prosecutor Act. Forward. And an essential step in our overall strategy to combat corruption. 
I look forward to the House dealing speedily with the process of confirmation of the nominee, a person of proven professional ability with an established record of integrity and independence of character. Here again, we are in uncharted waters, but I'm convinced that there is enough goodwill in the country to propel the first occupant of this position into setting a good and firm foundation for the position of the Special Prosecutor. Mr. Speaker, year in, year out, the nation's Auditor General produces a report on our public finances. It is often full of grand cases of corruption in our public services. The Auditor's General report on MDA liabilities as of 31st December 2016 makes truly alarming reading. I make reference to the fact that a staggering amount of 5.4 billion CDs has been identified as constituting fictitious claims. In the course of this address, in the course of this address, Mr. Speaker, the, the House has heard me struggle to identify a source of funding to build our roads. Every day we hear reports on our radios and televisions of dilapidated classrooms and children who sit on floors at school. Just think of the difference that 5.4 billion CDs would make to the nation's finances. That will certainly be enough to build and furnish hundreds of classrooms and construct the Eastern Corridor roads. Every citizen is affected by acts of corruption, and we should all work to tackle them. Government has an obligation to treat the Auditor General's report seriously and to work to retrieve illegally acquired monies from those who would impoverish us all. The role of Occupy Ghana in increasing awareness of the importance of the work of the Auditor General should be recognized. Mr. Speaker, the preamble to the Constitution of the Republic enjoins each one of us to uphold the principles of freedom and justice, probity and accountability. Others of these principles, I have made it publicly known that anyone who has information about acts of corruption by any of my appointees should bring it forward. And should be prepared to have it investigated. And should be prepared to back it with evidence, for I will have it investigated. I will have it investigated. So far, every single alleged act of corruption leveled against any oh, of my order, appointees order. has been investigated by independent bodies and in some cases by Parliament itself and the findings made public. From the allegations against the Minister designate for Energy at his parliamentary confirmation hearings, to that against the CEO of BOSS, to those against the two Deputy Chiefs of Staff, to the conflict of interest allegations against the Minister for Finance, and most recently to the claims of a distortion against the Trade and Industry Minister, they have all been investigated. And no evidence has been adduced to suggest any act of corruption, conflict of interest, or wrongdoing. Honorable members. Order. It appears, however, Mr. Speaker, that some are determined to the to stick to their politically motivated view that there has been corruption. This surely is not helpful. It is important to note that in my first year of office, despite having a clear parliamentary majority, two separate bipartisan probes in Parliament have been established to inquire into allegations of corruption as against zero in recent years. 
notwithstanding the persistent calls by the then minority over several allegations. Mr. Speaker, with the greatest of respect, and in the words of the Articulate Minister for Information, Mustafa Abdul Hamid, no matter how long a log stays underwater, it will never become a crocodile. <laughs> Speaker, let me repeat it for the benefit of my friends in the minority. No matter how long a log stays underwater, it will never become a crocodile. Order. Mr. Speaker, Honorable members, order. there was great relief around the country when the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea found in our favor in the maritime boundary dispute with Cote d'Ivoire, a dispute which was litigated by successive governments in the national interest, the last, the last lap being run by the able Attorney General M. Gloria Akufo. In our celebration, we did not forget that good neighborliness is the hallmark of our foreign policy. And I'm glad to state that our good relations with Cote d'Ivoire have not been affected in any way by the resolution of the dispute. Indeed, Cote d'Ivoire's renowned president, His Excellency Monsieur Alassane Ouattara, at my invitation, paid us a memorable official visit after the ruling to underline his country's determination to maintain, if not deepen, his good relations with our own. In fact, as you may remember, he and I signed on that occasion L'Accord Stratégique de Partenariat, a strategic partnership agreement for those who find French difficult, to emphasize the enhanced relationship we both seek for our two neighboring countries. Another obvious immediate benefit from the sensible reaction of both sides to the outcome of the dispute is the subsequent agreement by ExxonMobil, the world's largest publicly traded oil and gas company, to explore and develop with us potentially oil rich, rich oil blocks that were affected by the area in dispute. Mr. Speaker, much as we all recognize the importance of ex exploiting the offshore hydrocarbon resources of our nation, I think it equally critical for us not to ignore the possibilities of our onshore deposits, especially in the Voltaic Basin. So last year, I directed our state-owned oil development company, the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation, to pay particular attention to this potential. It is good to hear that that directive appear, appears to be yielding dividends. As GMPC, from the results of its pilot sur survey in the Voltaic Basin, has established the presence of a working petroleum system. I hope that eventually there will be something big for us to chair about. The Speaker, this year we'll continue the process of passing the legislative instruments of the National Youth and Sports Act, pursue the enactment of the draft National Sports College Bill, and create a sports fund to improve sports development in the country. The government also remains committed to the development of football in the country. We have begun the rehabilitation of the Accra Sports Stadium, otherwise known as the Ohini Jan Sports Stadium. And in partnership with the Inner City and Zongo Development Ministry and the Ghana Football Association, we are constructing a number of football pitches in the Zongo region in the solemn moving ceremony. Long may the Fourth Republic flourish. Mr. Speaker, our nation is on the right path. We will build a Ghana beyond aid. I thank you very much for your attention. May God bless us all, our parliament and our nation Ghana, and make her great and strong.
borrow a line from the one of the most prolific high life artists I could see Amp of Waji of blessed memory. Time changes. Yes, speaker. So today we hear that our colleagues would now remember a line in our national anthem. Help us to resist oppressors rule. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I'm into that. But this country has not only witnessed, but we have lived under oppression, suppression, subjugation, and indeed pulverization. Yes, in the lighter vein, indeed in the lighter vein, if the oppressor is being oppressed, <laughs> there can only be joy in the higher heavens. <laughs> that indeed is in the lighter vein. The speaker, of course, not to be missed, not to be missed today, is the inundation of the chamber by morning clocks. And of course, the accompanying dirges. Mr. Speaker, the people of Ghana remember that is only a year ago that my colleagues went into mourning. Mr. Speaker, I will play that. Having listened to the president, we adjourn in order to recompose ourselves. I will not miss the occasion to join our colleagues in the morning. It's only one year ago. Yes, we, got, we do know, we do know that the tears, the tears of the minority will not be enough to ferry them to the greater beyond. So we will join them and shed profuse tears. The Speaker having said so, and as I said, that is supposed to be in the lighter vein. Having said so, Mr. Speaker, having listened to the President, I will beg to move that this House takes adjournment until tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the forenoon. The Speaker, I so move. The Honorable Minority Leader. Mr. Speaker, what an important day and important occasion in the life of our strong and evolving constitutional democracy. I was touched by the presence, humor of ever of Novevila, and I, 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 I hope generously the Honorable Averji will translate it for the record of the Hansard of yeah. that important message, Mr. President, you wanted to convey. Mr. President, we have heard you on your state of promises. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. President, we have heard you that at least soul sourcing is still lawful in Ghana. <laughs> And Mr. President, we have heard you that that <laughs> Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker. Mr. 
Mr. Speaker, the Eastern Corridor, the Eastern Corridor Route, and the Bolga, and the Bolga Tanga Boku Road. If contractors are paid and not given razor cards or renegotiations, they will be completed on time. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, you 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 ended you ended on a good note of a proverb. The Honorable ABA for saying I won't pay royalties. When you see a frog come out of a deep hole, its assister is with it in the hole bringing it out. We will assist you. We will assist you out of the deep hole. But we appreciate this. I don't intend to provoke the debate. The, 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 the fidelity and candidness of what Mr. President has done, how I wish he had arrived on a Takuradi Paga train as he promised in one factory one day. On that notion, I second the motion for agenda. The motion for adjournment has been moved and seconded. All those in favor of the motion say aye. Those against say no. The eyes have it. This honorable house stands adjourned till tomorrow, 10 o'clock in the forenoon. Thank you very much, honorable members.